My name is David Nesbitt. I am lead at the MapZen Mobility Team. Uh, I was one of the very few attendees at uh, the first State of the Map US in Atlanta. I presented back there in uh, 2010. Um, I think it was to a classroom of about 20 people, so it's good to see uh, the community's grown. Um, today I'm going to talk about stable linear referencing for OpenStreetMap. Before talking about uh, linear referencing, I'm going to refer to our project uh, Valhalla, which is an open source routing and navigation software built on OpenStreetMap. Um, the reason to talk about this today is uh, we use some of the libraries and tooling within Valhalla to build the linear referencing, and we also support the linear referencing system within Valhalla for uh, additional applications. A couple of the features that I want to highlight and talk a little bit about throughout the talk. Uh, first off, we do what's called dynamic runtime costing, where rather than uh, computing the costs and embedding them into the data, what we do is at runtime, we have algorithms that use attributes of the data to generate the cost. This allows us to be much, this allows us to be much more flexible and build uh, optional uh, costing profiles for use at runtime. Um, I'll talk later about routing graph tiles where we segment data. Do I have this too high or? Closer? Okay, it wasn't high enough, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, we, we divide our, our routing network into tiles similar to maps where you have uh, geographic uh, regions. Um, this allows uh, regional uh, data access, uh, much, much better caching and memory use, and allows us to tar target mobile and embedded uh, platforms. And the final thing is map matching, where we can take GPS uh, traces and locations and match them to the road network in Valhalla and ultimately match them to the uh, linear referencing that we do. I went one too far, too, too, too far. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is how can we associate external data to the OpenStreetMap road network and make it usable for routing applications and other uh, creative and new applications. Uh, some of this data that we want to associate might not be, or most of the data is not going to be readily available to OpenStreetMap mappers, and some of it might vary over time things like traffic and parking, not, not readily something you can put in OpenStreetMap directly. Other data might be proprietary. A uh, company might be gathering uh, travel counts and, and things like that, and they might build applications around it and want to associate it to, to um, a routing engine, for instance. So the problem, to solve this problem, we're tr uh, creating a set of stable identifiers to reference a path along a roadway. Uh, we want these identifiers to be persistent and stable so that you can make small local edits to OpenStreetMap data and the IDs still refer to the same section of roadway. And we want the uh, system to be extensible so that as OSM adds new roads, um, new IDs or new, uh, new uh, linear referencing segments can be added. So the first question is, why doesn't someone just associate the data to OpenStreetMap way IDs? There are a couple of uh, potential issues with this. Uh, first off, OSM way IDs are not really persistent. Uh, they can change as edits occur. They can go away. New ones can be added, things like that. <clears throat> Secondly, they provide inconsistent localization. Um, Many OpenStreetMap ways are very short. The example here shows an overpass, which isn't really a very significant feature, but it gets its own um, way ID, and um, that's a little wasteful when, when you're talking about trying to, con trying to create a compact uh, representation of paths. Another problem is when there are large stretches of roadway going through many intersections, it doesn't really localize data to one small port portion of that uh, way ID. So the solution that we've come up with, um, 
we call OSMLR, which stands for OpenStreetMap Derived Location Referencing. We developed this as part of the Open Traffic Project, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, and we have documentation on GitHub. It's all open source and readily available. Uh, we create these um, linear referencing in two different formats. One is protocol buffer, which is useful for um, integration with applications uh, because it's very compact and quickly parsed. But we also output GeoJSON, which is much more interchangeable with other GIS tools. Um, OSMLR is based on the OpenLR standard, which uh, was developed by TomTom. Tom, and uh, we use a small portion of that, which does the linear location referencing. So the basic concept of location referencing is um, you define a set of location reference points. These are most, uh, most generally intersection points, points that are going to be fairly stable in your map or your road network. And then you provide hints about what the path in between them will look like, how long it is, what the uh, heading or bearing from the intersection is, uh, things like the, the road classification, uh, whether it's a, a link, a ramp, um, or just a general, general roadway. So once you have these location reference points, an application can go back and um, match them to the road network by finding candidates at each of the location reference points, candidate nodes and edges in the routing graph, finding the uh, possible paths between those two and selecting the path that most closely matches the length, bearing, and the other uh, parameters. And we have um, several documents and uh, documentation and blog posts uh, available at mapsend.com for um, much more details about, about the uh, OSMLR. So what does this um, uh, location referencing buy you and how might you use it? Um, so to make the um, IDs stable and persistent, you really need some entity that is in charge or maintaining the OSMLR um, definitions. So this, right now, we uh, at MAPSEN have created an initial set of these IDs, uploaded them uh, in a couple of places, which I'll talk about later, and um, they are available to the community. So a sample use of OSMLR is on the um, right side of the slide. Uh, there are kind of two phases to this. The first phase is you have to take these OSMLR location references and associate them to your road network, your routing graph. Uh, we do this with Valhalla internally. So we can take an OpenStreetMap planet or an extract uh, um, portion of the planet and ingest it into Valhalla to create you know, our, our, our uh, routing graph. And then we have a secondary step where we can bring in the OSMLR segment definitions and associate them to the Valhalla edges. So that now we have a one-to-one, -one car well, not always one-to-one, -one, but a correlation between Valhalla edges and the OSMLR identifiers or, or linear referencing segments that, they, that belong to those edges. So that creates a routable data set with associations to OSMLR. So now an application that wants to associate data to this and use it, um, I'll give an example of perhaps a motorcycle club has a lot of uh, users who are submitting uh, their favorite uh, motorcycle rides, um, and they want to be able to then share them with the community and um, have, the, have routes that are influenced by which roads are most popular and best for riding uh, motorcycles on. So they take their GPS data, run it through map matching, which will associate the, or match the GPS data to the routing graph, which now has OSMLR segments associated to it. So then they can now take and say, uh, this particular OSMLR segment has this particular um, trip on it. And they can do things like 
have the number of trips that take a particular OSMLR segment. Then with Valhalla, you could come in and do a custom routing profile that then brings in, as it's doing the, the uh, shortest path calculations, it can take in the OSMLR-based data. It knows that as it traverses the edges, it knows the, Valhalla, uh, the OSMLR segment ID can look up the popularity or travel counts from the uh, associated data and use that to favor the roads that have um, you know, more motorcycle use. So the first um, implementation of OSMLR and the development of OSMLR uh, was done within a project called Open Traffic, which was uh, sponsored by the World Bank. Um, it was an open source project, or is an open source project. Uh, you can go to uh, GitHub and uh, look at all the documentation, all the source code. Uh, but basically, they uh, are able to ingest a lot of archive data from um, companies, uh, you know, one in particular, Grab in Southeast Asia, um, able to ingest the data, match it to um, OSMLR segment IDs, and then have uh, statistics on you know, travel times and travel speeds along those segment IDs. Um, this was all done with Valhalla map matching, um, stored off in uh, various data sets, uh, which uh, are, uh, the World Bank and, and government agencies can use. Uh, but on the right, you can just see an example of a short route uh, that, uh, and it points out the actual OSMLR segment IDs, the speed, which is maintained in a separate data set, and um, um, you know it's colored based upon the uh, based upon the speed. So I wanted to mention um, some of the details behind OSMLR. I won't get into tons of detail in um, interests of time, and I'm hopefully providing plenty of um, resources and, and links that you can go and look and find more information. Um, I mentioned tiling. Um, we maintain persistent IDs in OSMLR by using a ID that it is, um, has a geographic component, which is the tile ID, uh, which um, follows the Valhalla tile specification, um, which um, is defined in this slide. Uh, but it also has a hierarchical component. So we segment what we call highways, which are OSM motorway, trunk, and primary tags, tagged um, ways. Uh, we store them in a four degree tile. Um, so it's a larger area, but there tend to be less of those. Um, they're less dense. Um, the next level is arterial, which um, are secondary and tertiary. They're one degree tiles, which is a slightly smaller region, uh, but they tend to be, you know, they tend to be a little more dense. And at, at the final level are what we call the local level, which for traffic, we are just including the unclassified and residential drivable roads. Uh, at this time, we're not including uh, cycleways, paths, and, and others. Um, we use Valhalla to generate the uh, OSMLR linear referencing segments. Um, it's a somewhat complex uh, process. Um, the link here to uh, our uh, technical preview um, describes it in, a, in a, uh, much more detail. But basically, as it um, encounters nodes and edges in the Valhalla graph, it um, assigns segment IDs. Um, most of the time, or a lot of the time, a single edge in Valhalla maps to a single OSMLR segment. Uh, but there are cases where multiple edges are merged into a single OSMLR segment. This is you know, when um, edge crosses an um, uh, overpass or maybe a, a driveway or, or you know, kind of a minor road that we don't really care about. And then kind of the least common but most complex case is um, edges can be split into multiple segments. Um, we keep edges, I mean, we keep segments uh, less than one kilometer at this time. Um, we skip what we call internal edges. These are uh, edges that basically 
are internal to intersections and just provide transitions between uh, different roads at that intersection um, and things like short turn channels or at grade um, transitions between two, two, um, two roads. Um, so we've created um, an initial set of uh, OSMLR segments for the world. Um, here are some statistics at the highway level. There's about 11 million uh, segments averaging about a half, you know, just over half a kilometer in length. Uh, level one, the arterial level, there's 26 million. They're also reasonable, reasonable length. Uh, level two, at the local level, you can see there's a whole lot more, and this is uh, you know, somewhat problematic. Um, um, and also, the average length gets very small there. They, they tend to be a lot of small segments. Um, and we've uploaded this data set onto Amazon Web Services Public Data Set Program. Um, we've blo uh, released a blog today, and uh, Amazon is also uh, tweeting and announcing this as well. Just real briefly, um, we're uh, working an update process so that um, at regular intervals, uh, we can bring in new OSM data um, and regenerate um, the OSMLR segment definitions. The goal is that uh, we want them to be stable and and not uh, change. We don't want to, you know, delete ones that just because of small edits. Um, but there will be times when there might be major changes to a road. Um, or a new intersection added that's of consequence that will require us to deprecate or remove an ID and replace it with new ones. Uh, but the goal is to be stable under you know, local edits, um, moving nodes, moving you know, slight adjustments to intersections, um, changing classifications, um, you know, tertiary, secondary, things like that, uh, tagging. Uh, we hope to maintain most of the IDs. And we're start, just starting to evaluate how effective this is. Um, so we haven't quite tuned it for all of the you know, tolerances that say this uh, intersection has moved outside of a distance that we know it's not really the same road anymore. Um, but preliminary, what we did is we have an, an early version from four months ago and just tested it um, against the latest OSM. And um, after four months, you know, 96, 97, 98 percent still match. Um, and we hope to do some tuning to um, improve those numbers. But the basic idea is most of these segments and most of the data will be uh, persistent. There will be a small number that will churn and, and need new IDs. Uh, so some of the future work, uh, I mentioned we want to experiment with the update process and the tolerances. Um, we think it's important to have methods of tracking the lineage so that if one gets deprecated and it's replaced by two new ones, we want to track that so that anyone who has associated data to that prior one can decide whether they want to transition that data to the new segments or not. Uh, we want to extend to uh, cycleways, paths, other OSM ways, but we want to do this in a way that doesn't uh, interfere with the ID space that we've already created. So they all have a different segment of the ID space. Um, I think that's about it. Um, this is the uh, team, um, Valhalla team, that did most of the OSMLR, OSMLO, OSMLR work. That was a criteria for who gave the talk, whoever could spell it. But, um, um, most of the team is sitting in the front row. We'll be out at our booth. Um, and also a big thanks to Matt Amos, who uh, was one of the original OSM pioneers, who's been a longtime colleague and did a lot of the original work with us. Um, this is all open source. Um, so if you have questions, con comments, contributions, uh, you can ask us on GitHub. You can email me. Um, or get in touch um, with our team. Thanks. We're taking questions now. Please raise your hand. Uh, I have a question about the sub-segmenting of an edge. 
and I remember from the original technical preview, you used the Bay Bridge in San Francisco as an example, and I believe there's like a one kilometer threshold, and you basically started from the beginning of the line string and you moved all the way through to the end. Um, and I was curious, because you mentioned the inclusion of intersections in consideration when creating OSMLRs now. Um, for example, with the Bay Bridge example, uh, traffic doesn't, traffic would, traffic changes along the bend of the bridge and it also changes in reaction to, for example, uh, an off-ramp onto the Yerba Buena, onto Yerba Buena Island. Would you consider that intersection or those off-ramps when developing OSMLRs now? Uh, yeah, I think those um, would split. Um, they're probably, I mean, they're probably major intersections or major exits off of there. So yeah, they would be, they would be, uh, part of that, we we definitely have, you know, all of the links and ramps um, as part of, you know, the breakage of where the segments start and end. Did that get your question or? Yeah. Well, yeah. So I was also just curious, like, is there a logic to starting on one end versus another, or like, how do you, how does that threshold work? Is it a hard threshold or? Um, the threshold is fairly hard, but it, it's it doesn't necessarily split into one kilometer. It will break it into equal parts. So if it's 1.5 kilometers, it'll break it at 0.75, so it doesn't matter which end, edge you, end you start from. Hi, my name is Amir, and uh, I would like to ask you, like uh, the data you are dealing with is so dynamic, how do you address the continuous changes that are happening? And like, how do you make sure that OSMLR is actually uh, making sure that th the new changes which are happening could be adopted? Yeah. So you're referring to OSM edits being? Yes, yes primarily. Um, yeah, that, that's a little bit up in the air. Um, we, we, wanna, we want to balance the kind of the pain of updating the segment space and having whoever has associated data to that segment space, ingesting new changes uh, versus, like you say, being more reactive. Um, right now, we're probably thinking a monthly or maybe even quarterly update. So it, yeah, it won't miss, it will miss a lot of initial edits, but it will pick, should pick them up on the next time around. So it's, yeah, we have to still balance that. And, um, you know, it's up to, customers and clients and users to kind of guide that and to, you know, figure out what that frequency should be. Thank you, David.